global economy started 2023 on stronger footing than expected, but a challenging economic backdrop and the banking crisis that started in March have certainly uh, brought about some uncertainty. This was reflected particularly in the office sector where occupiers are more cautious. Now, some markets have actually seen demand strengthen. Amsterdam, Miami, and Sydney are three global examples of that. And we continue to see companies gravitate to higher quality space that supports their workforce, enables their return to office strategies in certain locations, and also meets their sustainability commitments. Commodity office space remains very challenged, particularly in the US. In this segment, there's limited demand, limited capital available to fund building improvements and tenant build-outs, and also some distress increasing and likely to um, surface through the remainder of the year. Now, demand has also cooled a bit from the hot um, logistics sector. This has been one of the real standouts in recent years. We think the structural drivers for demand, rising e-commerce, the supply chain diversification, and incentives in certain places for industrials are still intact, and we'll support that sector. The fundamentals and still strong operating performance are also supporting the living sector globally. But in living, higher financing costs, economic headwinds, and in some cases, cyclical supply and demand imbalances will need to be navigated in the short term for sure. Leisure activities and resilient consumers have provided support for best quality retail and hotels. For hotels, Middle East has been the geography that's really led the recovery, but also China's reopening in January during the first quarter uh, created a surge in domestic demand that we think will have positive spillover effects globally as well. All eyes are on the debt markets where lending standards have tightened and borrowing costs are higher. Bank failures that we saw um, early this year have had an impact. But it's important to note that debt markets are functioning and there is certainly a diversity of lenders in the marketplace, which is a good thing. They're, they're active but selective. Asset values have adjusted already over the past year, but there remains a bit of a gap between buyer and seller expectations, which continues to hold back investment transactions. We think debt maturities uh, and some of that distress, especially in the office sector in the U.S., are likely to accelerate as we go through the year and, and also accelerate that price discovery process. We have seen a recent rise, uh, interestingly, in our JLL proprietary bidding activity data. Uh, this includes the number of bids per deal, which has been increasing uh, as an encouraging leading indicator, especially for industrial logistics and living sectors. These sectors combined account for over 50% of global investment volumes. So, Overall, we expect some more choppy waters as we navigate 2023, but we think conditions should stabilize and in some cases continue to improve as we move through uh, the rest of the year. I start with private wealth. I know it's not necessarily a capital source and rather a type, but private wealth is definitely one to watch as we move through 2023 as these investors look to take advantage of their slightly smaller debt profiles combined with those longer investment horizons, which offers a fantastic buying opportunity given the pricing list dislocation and more limited competition in the market. A lot of this money is Hong Kong and Chinese capital that's domiciled in Singapore, but equally we're seeing groups from the likes of Indonesia, the Philippines and India, as well as South America, showing interest in global real estate. Aside from private wealth, several of the Australian superannuation funds are becoming increasingly active globally, particularly in that partnership and platform space. Israel is a really interesting one. The Israeli shekel is depreciating due to the political instability domestically, and local banks have actually advised Israelis to invest into international currencies. This, combined with the opportunistic nature of the Israeli capital and the fact that their domestic market is small and extremely expensive, could result in an uptick in offshore investment to Europe and the US. Singaporean capital is pretty consistently the second most active cross-border investor year on year, with the United States being the first. So as we move into the second half of the year, we may see a re-emergence of both direct and indirect deals from the Singaporeans.
So there are three segments around how decarbonisation strategies are being implemented. The first one is asset class. So some asset classes such as offices and logistics are easier to decarbonise than other asset classes. The second one is investor profile. So you've got the core institutional investors such as insurance companies, you know, typically leading the way compared to sort of private equity groups. And then the final one is regional differences. So Europe is leading the way, and this is for a number of reasons. Regulatory pressures being a main one. You've got investor and occupier pressures. And then finally, political and cultural pressures. And it's really when transactions and value starts getting impacted, that's when change is accelerated. So, so what does this mean for the industry? I mean, you cannot have net zero carbon targets unless there's a huge amount of change transformation that needs to happen. And so this can occur in two ways when we're looking at investor groups. The first one being the investment process. So how is sustainability being integrated into new acquisition processes? And then the trickier side is asset management. So how do you manage your existing portfolio uh, as well as look where it stands today, but where it needs to get to? And then finally, when you actually just step into an asset that needs to be decarbonized, what do you look at? So the main strategy that investors look at is the CapEx. So what is it going to cost to decarbonize this asset? And you can look at a light retrofit strategy versus a deep retrofit strategy, which will depend on the cost. But what's just as important is how the building is then managed post the refurbishment project. And a really good, a big part of this is tenant engagement, but a really good tool to use is green leases. Cities around the world are experiencing significant structural change. Newer ways of working and living mean that many traditional urban cores, and really in particular central business districts, are finding themselves faced with the need to reinvent themselves to remain competitive in this new environment. Subdued demand for more office space, combined with more variable commuting and travel patterns, aging stock, competition from emerging sub-markets, and a desire for engaging experiences are affecting decisions from owners, developers, and visitors alike. While this presents challenges, the capacity for redevelopment in these hubs is immense. Their ability to accommodate growth at scale due to extensive infrastructure, institutional anchors, and existing but often underutilized real estate offers us the ability to create places that address many of the immediate and longer term issues that our cities face. Central business districts will be at the heart of transforming the built environment, but both the public and the private sector will need to be proactive in order to meet the challenges ahead. Through strategic partnerships that harness the lessons learned from the most sought after locations, as well as the comparative advantages of the urban core, we will be able to create more dynamic and resilient central business districts in the years to come. Striving through uncertainty and staying ahead of the curve, this is what every organization craves and an imperative to continuously adapt corporate real estate to new demands. In the 8th edition of the Top 10 Global Real Estate Trends, we explore how organizations can reinvent their built environment, helping them anticipate risk and build resilience to their real estate. So let's explore some of these trends as CRE leaders revisit their portfolio strategies. First, optimizing with impact. There is a need to identify portfolio investment with a long-term, people-first mindset by reallocating capital and prioritizing investment to meet talent and stakeholders' expectations. Second, dynamic operations. This is all about transforming operation and driving resilience in an agile world by leveraging advanced technologies to manage operation dynamically. But priorities should also be around the workforce. Labor markets were tight before COVID and have tightened up further in the rebound. So talent attraction and retention remains a key priority. We encourage our clients to think about the new employee value proposition they offer. The pursuit of better living conditions is gathering pace and at the same time, organizations privilege the quality of spaces over quantity. So think about creating connected communities. Location decisions will gravitate toward places where people can socialize, shop, live, work and eat. Identify innovation clusters and prioritize market with the strongest innovation and talent characteristics. 